It's, it's an honor and a privilege to, to introduce Kevin Ratner, who is the, uh, don't get hurt, who is the Los Angeles president of Forest City, which is national or international? You guys are a little bit parochial, huh? <laughs> um, a very well-known and potent team of developers uh, with their headquarters in Cleveland, uh, but doing a lot of work under Kevin in LA and on the West Coast and, and other members, other colleagues, other members of his uh, fa esteemed uh, family uh, in, in the uh, New York area. I think some of you remember uh, last week when Tony Vivas was here, who is uh, the assistant mayor and likely to become uh, the full-on mayor uh, in Barcelona. And one of the points that I made was that historically, uh, SciArc has, has tended to develop its discourse around architects, international architects, uh, and the discussion that follows the specifics of designing uh, and implementing buildings and, and cities. Um, and Tony Vivas was a piece of that equation, but a piece of the equation that we don't conventionally hear from. Nonetheless, an essential piece of that equation, because without his benediction, not, of a, hell, not a hell of a lot is likely to happen uh, in Barcelona. And along the lines of that discussion, uh, it's important for you to know, and, and, and there are many of you who don't. Kevin uh, is a trustee and has been for a number of years at SciArc, so he's on the SciArc board. So he's a willing, whether victim or participant, in, in the discourse here. And I think what, what he also brings, because he's, he's a younger generation, at least so he claims, and younger generations are supposed to have different perspectives than older generations, so it's claimed. And it will be interesting to see what Kevin's perspective is on how he makes the projects he makes what projects he selects, what projects he passes on, and how the criteria for doing projects that he's developed on the West Coast has to do either with a new conception, a new vision, or conceivably his uh, interrelationship with SciArc and the SciArc community. And as, as I said, he's an important participant in that. And by the way, to, to, to go back to the historic discussion, as some of you know, earlier in SciArc's history, the lineup for trustees at SciArc had largely to do with the usual architects and their intimate pals. And as we've stretched the discussion and the capacity of the board and people on the board, Kevin was one of the first people that, that uh, was willing uh, to roll the dice and get involved with, with an institution that, that's likely to threaten his uh, conservative pedigree and credentials. Uh, so a little bit is in fun, a little bit is facetious, a little bit is a little bit is serious. Uh, I'm glad you all were willing to give the other side of the equation some attention. As with Tony, I think it's critical that we hear what Kevin has to say, his perspective, what he contributes to this discourse, and how he facilitates the kinds of, of, of programs and projects and tactics and strategies that we're all interested in seeing come to fruition. Because his job is not to commission drawings, but to build buildings. Uh, Kevin Ratner, welcome to SIRC. Well, first, thank you all for having me here, and uh, I'm excited to give this presentation, and hopefully it will spur some, some good discussion. Also understand it's midterm time, so thank you all for taking some time out and uh, maybe getting a little break. 
So I thought I'd give you all just a little bit of background about Forest City. Eric gave you a little bit of it. Um, we are still headquartered in Cleveland. Um, it's about $11 billion of assets uh, that we have, that we continue to own. We manage our own properties. We build for our own portfolio. <clears throat> the company was started 93 years ago, actually, by my grandfather and one of his brothers. Uh, started as a lumber yard, then they started building homes, and they got involved with the contractors who were building the homes, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, <clears throat> we've been out here on the West Coast since the late 60s. Uh, we've, done, we did a, we've done over seven deals with the CRA before it was disbanded. Angeles Plaza is one of them. There's a few other, others around town that, we, that we've done. Um, to Eric's generational theme, uh, my cousin, Albert, who came out here the first time, who is now 93 years old, and did the first deal out here in the early 70s, said to me when, when actually Scott Johnson and myself were doing the Met Loss Project, he said, I knew downtown was coming back. I was just 30 years too early. So we do take a long generational approach to things. Um, you'll also see down here, we do big, small. That's uh, something, as we go through this presentation, you'll start to, to maybe see where that's coming from from us. Um, we are very involved with the management of the properties. So when we build something, we don't just get rid of it, we keep it. We like to say we join communities, we don't, we don't build buildings. So the idea of placemaking, of community, of what happens in the building and around the building, uh, once it's constructed and, and operational is very important to us. <clears throat> So we've come up with a, with a theory, I guess I would say, out here on the West Coast called, West Coast called Open City. Um, uh, it, it was actually started by uh, some user research and developments that we were looking at up in San Francisco. Uh, one property that's at the corner of Fifth and Mission, if you guys know San Francisco, it's right in the heart of, San, of, of downtown. It's just down the street from Bloomingdale's. It's very close to Soma. It's very connected to uh, transit. And, uh, and we were starting to do some research because we knew it was going to be an office building as to who the office users would be, what does office space look like. And this was in the early 2000s. We started looking at this. Um, this map is uh, it was uh, done by an artist in San Francisco, and what it actually is mapping is Twitter feeds. So you can see where the red is is the hot is the hot places for Twitter feeds. If you took that and you mapped on top of that housing prices, you would see that the housing prices match very similar to where the hot spots are. Other than in the upper left-hand corners, that red spot out there, that would be Alcatraz. So. Obviously not a lot of housing out there. Um, uh, and then as we started to notice, we looked at technology and we started to say, what's happening in technology um, that, that, is, that is showing behaviors that maybe weren't there before or maybe they're you know, millennia ago and are now coming back out? Um, because as, you'll, as we see, uh, people are getting more connected. There's, there's more opportunity to connect. You connect with people in so many different ways now. Um, and, uh, and so as that technology started to happen, you know, there was a sort of a natural inclination to say, well, maybe place doesn't matter as much. All that matters really is my phone in my hand, and at, with that, I could locate anywhere and do whatever I need to do, so who cares where I sit? Um, but what we actually found as we began to talk to people is that, is that uh, the way they were using the space changed and, and in many ways became more important. <clears throat> so the, what's fo going to follow is just some statistics that we've thrown up there. Some of them are, are I think, are interesting, but they're kind of showing a, a trend, right? So the co-working spaces, you see so many of them. I know downtown, not far from here, the hub opened up. We opened up a hub at our project up in San Francisco, and it's been the most successful hub globally of, of any of them. Um, so we know, that, we know that place pretty well. This Airbnb statistic, I think, is just unbelievable. It, there are many ways to interpret what this says and what that means, but the fact that this technology is enabling people to, to, to find these rooms, their rooms and they're using it more than they're using Hilton hotels is just staggering to me. Farmers markets, you know, very much the same thing. It's community. It's about people coming together. Place matters. It's not just the technology. So then we asked ourselves, you know, wh why, what is happening? So this is a picture at our project up in San Francisco, <clears throat> there is a, was an existing building and there is a tunnel. And underneath the tunnel, every Wednesday and Friday, we would bring in food trucks. We also had a small company who rented some space for us. The company was called Square. It was about 
six people and they were just getting started. They were trying to figure out how they were gonna do this thing. We also have another company up there called Tech Shop. Tech Shop is a, think about it as a gym membership for makers. So they have CNC machines and they have much like the magic box. So they have, you guys would all go crazy in this space. They have industrial sewing machines and woodwork and everything. And you can, for $100 a month, you can go in and you can use all the machines you want. So this company, Square, prototyped their device at Tech Shop on, on the property. They then went down to the food trucks and they said, hey, try this property, try this out, and let us know your feedback. The guys in the food trucks used it, the, the consumers used it, they got feedback, they went back to their office, they changed their model, they changed their prototype, and they kept doing it, and it was all happening just on our property. So that was, that was very interesting to us because it's, it's these sort of disparate parts that are there that are making this space very attractive to a company like Square. Fast forward three years, Square's worth $5 billion, and you know, we'll, we'll see what's gonna happen with that, but, but a really interesting story. So the open city concept, we've, we've, we've taken the open city and we've tried to use it as a lens to look at the, the developments that we do. We do three primary food groups of development. We do residential, we do office, and we do uh, retail. Retail is mostly in the form of large sort of fortress malls of which you know, we haven't built one in, in a while and probably will never build one again, but we own a bunch of them. Um, and uh, so as we were starting to talk about residential, residential again is, is it's interesting because, because it's obviously the place that people live and how do they use that space? What attracts them to wanting to be in these buildings? What attracts them to the neighborhoods that they want to go and why is one neighborhood more attractive than the other? And we see some of that changing as the demographic changes and as needs change. There's a lot of discussion about very small units in urban environments because people just want to get into the urban environment. The environment is the amenity not necessarily the building, stuff like that. Retail, retail is actually the place that we've spent the least amount of time, but I think is actually the most interesting. Um, because I, I, you know, we believe that the, that the retail, retail is changing from a transactional environment to an experimental one. So you, people like to see things made. They wanna, they wanna see what's happening sort of behind the, the curtain. They also want, it seems like, more sort of bespoke, more smaller products. They're less interested in the large run, uh, you know, mega stores. Um, and again, this is, you know, we're looking sort of at the bleeding edge a lot of times to see what's happening out on the wings of the bell curve, you know. What, what are the extreme users doing? Because eventually those, those uh, the, that proclivity and what those people like to do will move to the middle. And so that's where we like to look when we start doing research about what we think is coming next. Um, again, some more uh, uh, statistics about some of the interesting companies. A, a little bit San Francisco focused, but you know, I'm sure all of you guys use all of these things. The fact that, that you know, photos get liked a billion times a day on Instagram is just, it's just a staggering number to me. And I, I love Instagram, but that's just staggering to me. Um, so then we said, well, we have this technology. We see what's happening in technology. And, and we take places, we design places. So how do we, how, how, how does that interaction gonna work? How does one influence the other? How is one going to, uh, what can we learn from one to pull into the other? So this is just some of the ways that we see kind of what we, what we used to do, which would be over on the right hand side and what we're, what we're moving towards on the left. Um, you know, master planned as opposed to co-created over-designed as opposed to open platform. Um, uh, and so, again, we went back to technology and we said, how is this going to, uh, what, what, can we, what can we pull from this in order to help us learn? So um, we came up with this sort of analogy that said that you know, it's the hardware and the software. The hardware is the building, the software is what happens around the building, the programming of the building, the events that you do in the building, the, the culture of the building. And we looked at, at the iPhone, right? So the iPhone is obviously very beautifully designed. Uh, I would argue a big part of why it was successful was because of its design, because it felt good in your hand. Um, and, but, but what really makes that thing successful is what you can do with it, right? I mean, you know, they, I've heard people say that the computing power of the iPhone now was more than they had when they landed the first uh, you know, person on the moon and it's in your hand. I mean, I'm just constantly amazed at what this little thing can do. But you know, again, it's the it's the it's the technology, it's the hardware, it's the software. They're working together. One feeds the other, but they're but you can't really pull them apart. You need both in order to, in order for it to work. Um, 
Open City is, 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 there's a reason we chose the word open because, you know, we, we want to be open to this conversation. That's why I'm very excited about this talk. I may be going a little fast through it because I want to get to the questions. I, wanna, I want the interaction. I want to hear what you guys think about this um, and what we're talking about. So um, there are, we, 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 we probably overthink a lot of what we do. Uh, Scott Johnson might agree with that, having worked with us on a couple projects. But um, uh, you know, it's, about, it's, about, it's about the value that we're doing because almost by definition, when we go build a building, it's obviously a brand new building. It's usually in an area that's either up and coming or already established. So by definition, we're coming in there and we're gonna need top of the market rents. We're gonna need top of the market rents for retail, for office, for anything, right? In order to make the whole thing work. So <clears throat> what is the value that we're giving people in order to get them to pay those rents? So what do we, what do we believe in? So we believe in creating connections. Um, uh, we want to create platforms for people to connect. So the square guys use the tech shop guys, use the food truck guys. They're using the people who are on the site. They're, 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 they're engaging with the people around the site in order to develop what it is they're doing. And it's happening all on, all on our property. Um, access is obviously a very important thing. If you throw up walls and you make an ivory tower and no one can get into it and no one wants to get into it and everyone's intimidated by it, you know, how are you gonna get the people to start to to start to work together? How are you gonna build these networks? How are you gonna get them to get uh, the exposure that they need to each other in order to, you know, make the sum of the parts greater than the whole? And then of course, you know, you always want, want people to be uh, inspired and, 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 and surprised by things, you know? Discovery is such a big part of, of, I, think, of I think, placemaking. Um, you know, again, you want them. You want them to be. You want the property to be ever changing. So, as we think about the design and as we think about what's going on with the with the buildings and we think about the community, how can we continue to to uh, not have it be a static place? Not have it be a place that once you've seen it, oh, I'm not going back there again. You know, it's like uh, that's why I think the retail is so interesting. You know, these malls. Nothing changes in those malls, right? I mean, you know, okay, so maybe they get a different light or maybe the fountain moves in a different way, but how could we take a mall and make it something so that you wanted to come back to see what was gonna be there the next day? Or an office building, if you know, there's, a, there's changing art on the walls and there's galleries and there's events that are happening. Um, and, and, and a lot of it is user generated, generated by the people on the site who, who want to engage. And then this idea of making it custom, so, you know, it, 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 when you look at some of these open office environments, you know, and you go, I haven't been to the new Zappos offices, but I was at the old ones, and it was a mess. I mean, you know, these people are in these cubicles and they've got stuff everywhere, but they just love it, you know. Their personality is just coming out all over that office, and so it's, and, and, and you know, the, the, the satisfaction of the employees is just so high. You see stuff like that, so people want, to be able to, to, to have an environment that feels reflective of them and as they change and as, the, as, as uh, their ideas change and their desires change, they wanna be able to change that with them. And then be a testing ground. So, you know, there was part of that in the open, in the open city slide. You know, don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's a big, that's a big part of what we're doing. Try things out. If it doesn't work, then, you know, ditch it and move on to the next thing, but keep trying because that's how you're gonna make it attractive. And then, um, uh, you know, much in the way that, that uh, the, the, the square guys were able to use the, the property and what was on the property to find, their, to find the right idea, it's, uh, it's, this, it's this same idea. So as you do events and you do other things on the properties, you know, it, it, it starts to create a, a, a place that, that people desire to be around, right? Because it's a place where they can get ideas, where they can connect into the community and get feedback on what they're thinking in. And sometimes I ask the stupid question, right? So they're not stuck in their cubicle, cubicle or whatever. So how do we do it? Um, this is sort of our, of our uh, mission statement, if you will. Uh, so I'll give you a second to kind of read through it. <clears throat> I don't usually like to put too many words on a slide, but. Guess I had to here. Um, uh, so this is this is about when we're when we're when we're trying to decide where to go and what sites we think might actually work. 
uh, for, for a project such as this. Um, <clears throat> the idea is to go not just pick a site because I like the corner or because it has a good adjacency, but you know, what do the people around the site think about it? What are the people who I want to attract to the site who maybe aren't there? What, what, what would they want? So it's about going out and connecting to your users and doing user research, which for many things, you know, when Apple was designing the, the, the iPhone, you know, there was a lot of interaction between potential users. Real estate doesn't necessarily always do that. You know, it's like, oh, I know who the renter is. I know how to design it. We're good, right? As I start to get older and the renter starts to seem, they seem to continually get younger from an apartment perspective, I'm not so sure I know anymore. So, you know, you got to connect and figure out what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's trying to make all the parts that you put together uh, greater than the sum of the, the whole greater than the sum of the parts. So when we build a, a residential building, say, and there's ground floor retail, Rather than just looking at the ground floor retail and saying, oh, you know, put a bagel shop in there and put a restaurant in there and you're done. Why not make the ground floor retail an amenity to the building? What do the people want? Co-working facilities, uh, you know, lots of different things that could go in there. Something like a tech shop, a war, you know, uh, we have a building that's over by, that we built in the 80s that's over by FITM. And we took some of the common areas there and we actually put in some stuff for the, for the kids who are at the fashion school to use. So there's sewing machines in there and there's mannequins in there. So when, they making, when they're making their, their, uh, their garments, they can pin it up and all this stuff. And, you know, lo and behold, they're used all the time. So that was you know, a case of just listening to the community and, and, and getting that idea of uh, the idea exchange in order to make it better. And, uh, and, and do some stuff that's crazy. You know, uh, you know, for the most part, I have, to go, I have to go back to Cleveland and ask permission to do just about anything in a, in a company that as it gets bigger becomes more corporate. Um, but you know, there's a level at which, and there are times at which I don't ask. I just ask for forgiveness. And, you know, most of the time it, 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 it works itself out, but um, you know, you gotta, gotta get out and inspire people, and oftentimes that's by doing things that are a little out of the norm. Um, events, events is a very, we found it to be an incredibly uh, important part of what we do. And you know, it could be everything from a TEDx conference to something way more local and smaller. It could just be, bringing in people to talk, you know, uh, the hub up in, up in San Francisco, and I'm sure they do it down here as well. They do, last year, they did over 300 events over one year, and it was all uh, put together by people that work at the hub. So the hub spent no money putting these events on. We spent no money putting these events on. It's just the people who come to the hub and use the hub would, would, would talk to each other and they'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Let's get someone in to talk about that. It might be international water contracts. So they bring someone to talk about it. So you give them the space, you give them the opportunity to do it. We've also found that it's great if you have the opportunity to, to, to do uh, events and things on sites before you build on them. Um, one thing I've noticed, because we do a lot of development on sites that are a little bit off the beaten track, right? So it's not really getting a lot of activity. The activity is sort of a few blocks away. What we need to do when we build the project is we need to pull the sort of the blood flow over to that property, right? Because people get very set in their ways. You know, you drive down Olympic and you don't turn right on Broadway, you turn left on Broadway. Even though there might be great things that are right on Broadway. So, you have, to, you have to sort of teach people that they can go right on Broadway, right? And change the way that that flow happens. And we find that events is a great way to bring people together and, and bring attention to sites that, that, that uh, are just on their way up or, or parts of a community that's not quite getting the attention it might deserve. Um, and and this, is really, this, this really applies, it applies to all the food groups, but it really applies to office. And, um, uh, the, the, the idea of the office is, particularly in San Francisco, but we're seeing it down here too, and certainly seeing it in, in Brooklyn and in Manhattan and, and DC, all, all cities we work in, is that the competition for engineers and the competition for workers is very extreme. There's, there's frankly a, a lot more jobs and there are people to fill them in a lot of these companies. So it's a talent war. How do you attract the people? How do you get them to want to come work for you? You know, you can put a slide in your, in your office and you can do a cafeteria with ridiculously great food and you know on the theory that they're never going to leave so they're going to work for you all the time or you could be like Google and go to the middle of nowhere and create a whole community and then hopefully they never leave 
Or the approach that we've, that we've taken, and we've had some success with it, is to say if we create a dynamic place connected to the community and we put a ground plane in that has uses that, are, that, that, in, that inspire people and bring them together, then the work of the people, and then, and then the companies will want to be there because the, because the people who work for them will want to be there. So now I've created a, a very dynamic feedback loop that's going to that's going to increase people's willingness to pay as they want to be around this activity. They want to be around this uh, uh, dynamic place. Five M project is the project in San Francisco, Fifth Emission that I was telling you about. <clears throat> uh, so Square was there. Square grew. Eventually, we couldn't keep Square there anymore, so they moved out. Lo and behold, right behind them, it just so happened that Jack Dorsey and Marissa, the two CEOs of the two companies, are good friends. Jack told Marissa he was moving out. She was like, I want the space. She could have gone 100 other places in San Francisco, but she chose to come to 5M. Why did she choose to come to 5M? We believe, and, 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 and it's playing out to, look, to be the case, that she was really interested in the community that was 5M. It was all those people that were, that were there. It's the food trucks and tech shop and the hub. And we have digital film school and there's, there's activity and there's things happening and it's great for her workers because that's where they want to be. Um, the, the, uh, of course, uh, when you come in and you drop down, I mean, at 5M, there happens to be about a million eight square feet, high rise buildings. It's on Fifth Street, a block away. Sixth Street in San Francisco is the highest concentration of, of affordable housing in the city. A lot of nonprofit organizations, a lot of people who deal with the homeless, a lot of homeless. And so we're, we're right on the edge. And, uh, and the city, as you, many of you probably know, is struggling a lot with gentrification and what that means. But how can we keep our project connected to that? How can we keep our project uh, how can we fight the sort of gentrification idea and the ivory tower idea? And a lot of it has to do with, with you know, interactions, right? So there's a school nearby. You know, you, you start uh, volunteer programs for people who work in the offices to go, to go do things for the school. Or tech shop has open capacity, so you bring the kids in because they don't have, uh, you know, woodworking shop anymore at, at the school. You bring them to tech shop during the day and let them work on the, in the woodworking place over in tech shop, right? So you create these, these connections. Uh, to the community, and, and it's, it's always trying to, 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 how do we maintain that? Pier 70 is another project up in San Francisco. Again, it's right on the waterfront. Um, it used to be a shipyard, a naval shipyard, and uh, it's now, we're now redeveloping it into a mixed use, uh, a mixed use place. The thing that's really interesting about Pier 70 is it's owned by the port. We do a lot of public private joint ventures. We work a lot with cities to take underutilized properties and turn them into something different. Um, what's amazing about this property is that we can build retail, office, residential, all of it together right on the waterfront and right next to it is a very vibrant community of Potrero Hill and Dogpatch and they have not had access to the water through the development of Pier 70. We will give them access to the water. So it was very attractive to us to be able to do that and put that in place there. Um, you know, one, another project in, in San Francisco that we did is 88 units, not Blossom Plaza, that's down here, but um, you know, there's, 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 that one only has 88 units, so as opposed to Blossom Plaza, which is 255 units, it's harder to create community because you just have fewer people. So um, Blossom Plaza, which is just down the street here, it's at the Gold Line stop in Chinatown. Uh, it has about 18,000 feet of retail, 255 units, about 20% of the units are affordable. It's right on a Gold Line stop. Um, uh, and so the challenge there for us is, is it's in and, and uh, you know, it's in Chinatown. How do we go about making the community? How do we use that 18,000 feet of retail to create the community? Where do we go talk to people? How do we find people to talk to, to, to figure that out? Um, and what, we, and what we're going to do there. Um, that, again, was a piece of property that was owned by the city. Um, they had a lot of requirements. They needed a cultural plaza. They needed 175 public parking spaces. The site is a very difficult site. It's, it's on a very steep slope. It's got a split seismic zone. It's class five methane zone, plus all the parking we had to do, plus all the affordable we had to do, plus all the subsidies that we had to line up to do it. So it was a very difficult project. We were actually selected in 09, I believe, it's 08, 09. And uh, we just broke ground last month. So, you know, that took us uh, five years, is that right? 
three years, four years, to get to the point where we actually get to break ground in order to get all of, pull it all of it together and keep it all going. But because it's right on that, right on that gold line, and because we believe in Chinatown and believe that there's an opportunity there, you know, we're willing to go do that work in order to get the in order to get the project. Um, as I was saying about retail, we've done less research on retail, um, but but to me. The, the mall, when you sit in a mall and you watch the people walk around, it feels like a town square, but nobody's talking to each other. There's no sharing of any ideas. There's no communication. They're all just sort of walking around a little bit like zombies. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's really, I think that's a really interesting opportunity. I think it's a super interesting opportunity. Um, you know, so much for my idea of not a lot of words on the slides, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the mall is a, is a, is an interesting lo location for us. So that's really the end of my presentation. Um, this presentation for me is really about the ideas that we're playing with, the concepts that we're trying to understand. And so I put together a couple questions because this is a really interesting crowd. I don't usually present to crowds of uh, highly creative, interested, engaged people like this. So. Uh, you know, I'd like to I'd like to open it up for questions, and you know, you can we can talk about these questions, we can talk about other questions, but um, um, I'm really interested in the exchange of ideas around some of the things that I was talking about. So hopefully, it was clear enough that there are questions to ask. Mr. Gilmore, of course. Um, I think I can speak loudly enough. Um, I, I, cl clearly, uh, your company's an older company. It, you know, you're the next generation of, of that company, and, and the corporate philosophy is evolving. And, and it's pretty clear that architecture has a pretty significant part in that. But what I'm, what I'm wondering is, at some point, if not now, are the architects involved programmatically? Uh, so, so that they're not responding to your program, that what effectively they're doing is protect, perhaps taking the, the bones of your program and then you know, superimposing their view of a different program or an enhanced program or something like that. So I, I guess my question is, where, where in this process does the architect begin to not just deal with the architecture but with the philosophical uh, notions that you have in, in an evolving company? So ideally, the architect is involved from the very, very beginning, all the way in the user research, because um, <clears throat> you know, we certainly have worked with, with architects whose initial reaction as soon as I give them a problem is to pick up a pen and draw a solution. Um, I would say, pause. Don't draw anything yet. Let's talk about the problem. Let's talk about why. Let's talk about where the problem came from and what the solutions might be. And then let's talk about how the design comes out of that, right? So it's that user research's idea. It's that idea of saying, um, what, what, what is it that we're trying to achieve, and how are we trying to achieve it, and what is the end result we want, and then how does the architecture respond to that? You know, a, a lot of architects do that. Just do that by. It's just part of, at least in my experience, it's just part of who they are, it's how, how, how they look at the work. But I've also had architects who I've worked with who have not been that way, and they don't particularly think a lot about what's going on around them or who the user is, surprisingly enough. No one Which way does Scott work? <laughs> Scott is very collaborative. He wants to start from the beginning and work all the way through. Yeah. Hi. Um, this question may be a little bit inside pool, but also to, to expand to downtown LA. So you talk about the um, demand, meeting the demand of cr the creative office user. Uh -huh which historically is like to have been in sort of fugitive space, um, more horizontal space, mm -hmm. you know, converted warehouse, those kinds of things that also always has the feature of a relatively low rent. How do you reconcile that with your class A office portfolio and the rents that you need to achieve, particularly in new construction? And then parenthetically, what do you see as opportunities for creative office in downtown Los Angeles given the physical structure of, say, all the Class A office inventory on Bunker Hill, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, I think Library Tower will make an excellent residential conver conversion. Um, uh, uh, 
So what, what we found actually, and, and I, I would, I mean, I know I've talked a lot about San Francisco, but in many ways, a lot of what, uh, they're, they're really very much on the forefront, a lot of this stuff, right? A lot of the tech companies a lot, you know, are coming out of there, obviously. They're a small enough place that things happen pretty quickly, and the market heats up there really fast, so stuff happens really fast. Um, Soma is getting higher rents than the Class A office spaces. So, um, you know, it's hard to build a, a large floor plate office building. Um, it's hard to find the room to do it. It's hard, it's hard to make it look good, right? Everyone likes tall and skinny. No one likes short and wide. So um, uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge. But if you can deliver it, if you can deliver the, 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 the creative space, people will pay for it. So I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to go over to CBRE's office in downtown Los Angeles. It's over on Bunker Hill. But it is an open floor plan. There are no offices. Actually, I shouldn't say that. There are offices, but no one's assigned to them. And they went with something that's called fully addressable, which I'd never heard of before. But basically, you have all the employees have a locker with all their stuff in it, and they come in in the morning, and they pull their stuff out, and they go to a desk. And they work there all day, and then they gather their stuff up, and they put it back in the locker. So, and they're paying big rent to be on the top of that building, and they paid a lot of money in TIs to make their to make their that that office space what they wanted, and it's now so successful that they're rolling it out globally to all their offices. So I don't know that I would equate necessarily open open floor plans, creative office with low rents or cheap rents. Certainly, that's where it came from, right? You look at some of the spaces down here, you look at some of the spaces in Soma. Um, we have a project in Brooklyn called MetroTech. It's seven million square feet of office, right? So there's a lot of, I mean, some of, the, some, of those, some of those people are government workers, right? So that's just a forest of cubicles and that will always probably be a forest of cubicles just because that's what the user is. But other users there are demanding things like open floor plans, and they want to they wanna get higher density. They don't want 250 square feet per, per, per person. They want it down to 90 feet per person. You know? They don't want offices around the perimeters. You know? They want conference rooms around the perimeters, and they want, you know, they want interesting stuff on the ground floor, and they want art, and they want, you know, that's what these users want. So, um, and, and that's where most of the growth is happening in these, in these young startup companies. Um, I think I got most of your questions. Um, and and you know, I was joking about Library Tower, but you see these tall, slender towers, right? Mm -hmm. And if someone wants 100,000 square feet, they're going to have to go on 10 floors. This is not going to create the culture that these companies want. Um, and, and, and this is just a, a speculation, and I'll probably be proved wrong, but my guess is, is that law firms aren't going to want that, accounting firms aren't going to want that, banks aren't going to want that. They're all going to move towards this concept of, of shared space, of open space, of a space that's more dynamic, of a space that's, that's, uh, that, in, that inspires. You know? And so something like Library Tower, I think, I think it's got a problem. So do you think the city will become, is that, is that a recipe for a lower scale city? So. Uh, no, it's got to be tall and big. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and you know that's that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question, Tom, because I, I don't I don't know that I've thought that far ahead from an office perspective. Um, you know, I know the city right now is, is playing with this idea of, of, of creating, you know, like an adapter for use ordinance, which they did for residential, for commercial. You know, if you look down Broadway, you have all these buildings that are empty. This is the exact conversation the city was having when they came up with this adaptive reuse ordinance for, uh, for residential, which allowed you to do a lot of your projects and me to do a lot of projects. So now they want to do it with office space. And, uh, and, and you know, all of those buildings, some of those buildings are small, but a lot of those buildings are really big. There's one building I can think of that's a million square feet on like nine floors, right? And I think perfect location for office. Right? Everyone else is thinking about it as residential. You cut a hole in the middle of it. Light well is expensive. You're losing square footage. To me, perfect for, for office. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic when you start to think about these companies coming up. Where are they going to go? How are they going to afford the rents? How are they going to think about their space? What do they want out of their space? Where do they want to be? And most of them want to be in urban environments, right? You look at Google in Venice. And, and we're actually doing some research now as to what that effect has been. But I have friends who live in Venice and they get their doors knocked on all the time by people who are not brokers, technically, but are saying, do you want to sell your house? 
because all the Google employees are just running around trying to place, find a place to live because they all want to bike to work and they all want to live in Venice. So Google went into Venice, right? They didn't go out to the Inland Empire. They didn't go, they went into a highly uh, uh, creative, interesting place that you would not necessarily think of as a corporate headquarters. Thank you. I was just going to ask you right here. Ah, uh, yes. Just one more question. <laughs> uh, just picking up on what um, uh, Tom was saying as well a little bit. Uh, the idea that um, architecture is somehow involved, but how, <laughs> how, how would you see our role exactly in this project? And so you made an interesting distinction between uh, hardware and software being involved in the production of at least development and buildings indirectly right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you envisage architecture and architecture education moving in that direction as well. And so maybe focusing more on networks rather than on objects per se, or both and just what you think about and how that can fit in your project of the, of the city. Yeah, um, uh, you know, look, I, I, I'm on the board of SIRC. I love architecture. Architecture is something that I, I believe in wholeheartedly. And, uh, and uh, I think it's so integral to this process because you can come up with great ideas and you can say, hey, I want to create all these interactions and I want to have a place that people are going to be able to you know, walk around and sit outside and interact with each other and go here and go there. But if it's not designed correctly, if it's not designed to facilitate all of those things, if the interior spaces don't make sense and they're not uh, and they're not able to be used in the way that people need to use them, then you've missed the whole, you've missed the whole point. So it, 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 you need an architect who, in, in my opinion, is, is willing to have the conversation with you at the beginning about the user, about what you want at the end, you know, what you want out of this building and how you want it to operate, and then that architect needs to be able to, del to deliver on that, right? So, so, you know, architecture is object, I mean, I mean, maybe I shouldn't editorialize, but in San Francisco, which is obviously a city we work in a lot, you know, they got a lot of ugly buildings. Um, so, you know, they're not, my, my, my sort of opinion of, of San Francisco is they're not so interested in the building. They're more interested in the ideas and they're more interested in what, what's inside the building, the people in the building, right? Because they're very focused on that. I'll, I'll never forget one time I was on, I think it was Union Street or something, and there was, this was like my quintessential San Francisco moment, there was a guy in like a, a, a white and blue striped shirt, you know, blue blood, buttoned down, sitting next to this kid who had more jewelry in his face. I mean, like, I don't even think I could see any skin. There was just like jewelry everywhere. And they were sitting there having a coffee, talking, right? And I was just fascinated by that concept that the, you know, they weren't judging each other based on what they looked like. They were judging each other on the ideas that they were exchanging. And I think that's really interesting, right? So you could apply that to architecture, right? They don't care so much about the buildings. They care about what's going on inside the buildings. Yeah. I guess my question would be is that I think um, we as architects and the profession, I think we need to figure out a way how we can like merge architecture together and educating the public and, 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 and providing new concepts and, 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 and extra urban spaces that would allow us to rethink about a city and how we live and place within that city. So my question here would be how uh, could we, you as a corporation and we as architects, could begin to come together and collaborate in those type of things that will allow, uh, I guess, us to begin to educate public on how we should, we should live and how we should think about lifestyle. Because I think that it's a danger in a way if we allow the public to um, inform how the spaces should be because I think then it will become like an economy that is based upon trends that are constantly evolving. And I think that if we begin to think as architects and as builders, as developers, uh, coming together with the developers and figuring out that type of dialogue, how we can build, I think it, that would be like an interesting party to where we can begin to think about something that we never really thought that could, that could arrive. So the, 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 uh, the conver I mean, you know, when you, when you involve the public, I think, I think, I think what, what you, if I could interpret some, maybe some of what you were saying is that oftentimes when you involve the public, things have a tendency to drift towards sort of a lowest common denominator. Um, you know, it's like if you look at, at Yelp, a lot of times what happens if there's a lot of Yelp ads, it's, you know, whatever they're reviewing is going to wind up with sort of like three and a half stars. Because if you get enough people, there's going to be enough who like it, don't like it, it's going to wind up just sort of in the middle. 
and kind of beige, right? So how do you have the conversation, which I think is a fascinating conversation. It's like the question that I put up here. Can we ask architects to think about experience design as much as architecture design? So it's, it's, it's how do they, how do you have the conversation? How do you think about the user? How do you think about what they want? How do you inspire them, right, to really understand design and really understand why one building is different than another, why one thought process that went into creating something is different than another thought process that goes into the, having that, uh, cr creating that design. So I think that interaction is what is what is going to make great buildings and what's going to make great, great places. Um, um, I do find a struggle between, you know, so we start talking about this stuff, right? And we have enough people in our company who have been around enough and been through the ups and downs enough. So they're like, oh, that's hoteling. Yeah, that didn't work. We tried that in the 80s. You know, and you're like, okay, no, it's not really hoteling because the world is a very different place, right? So, um, but, but, you know, the, the reason that hoteling didn't work, obviously, because they didn't have the connectivity that we have now, but they designed whole buildings to, to you know, they, they ripped out all the TIs and they built all this stuff in order for people to do hoteling and it failed, right? And now they're like, oh my God, I spent all this money to do this, now what do I do? So it's the idea that, uh, I think that one of the challenges that we have and is, is how do you create a place that can be dynamic enough and that can change enough as you go through time, as, you know, because if you are following, you have to follow some trends, right? Because you need the space to be marketable, you need it to be desirable, but you also want it to be adaptable so that it can move as the, as the desires move, you know? So now, you know, Twitter may want 100,000 feet on one floor. Well, you know, who knows? Maybe in 10 years they're going to want 10,000 feet on 10 floors in the library tower is a great idea, you know? So uh, it's hard to predict. You want that flexibility, but you also need to kind of meet the demand that's out there. I, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough challenge when you're doing things that take years to gestate, and then once they're in place, they're not going away for a long time. So, you know, the built environment is a, is a, is a, is a challenging place to work from that perspective. Um, Kevin, thank you. I, mean, I think you're, you're speaking to a very sympathetic audience, and I think anytime architects hear a developer who's interested in, in issues like culture or, or even art, um, you know, we're winning. But, you know, from, from another perspective, I think that, that how things get capitalized is interesting to me. I know Tom has spoken about this a lot. And so my question would be, you know, how do you, as a developer, convince the sort of financial side of the equation, meaning bankers, that you have a different pro forma? Because I know when Tom spoke here recently, and you, Tom, you mentioned you know, how many times you had to kind of like convince people that the new model was interesting, and the answer would be like, well, why would you change it, the one that we have already works? Well, so how, okay, <laughs> fair enough. So I guess there, it's a two-part question. I mean, you know, how do you pay for your own projects? And then when you don't, I mean, how do you convince partners to, to actually get behind a new concept? Yeah, so uh, for, the, for the most of our uh, life as developers, we've used our own equity to uh, de develop. That, that has, End of story. That has changed. No, 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 no. Well, wait. Well, wait. We use our own equity. We still get a loan. We don't build them for 100% equity, right? I mean, loans help juice your returns and all of that stuff. It's a question of how much leverage you want to use, but we use leverage on everything. So we're always talking to banks. We're always bringing people in. Since the downturn, a lot of that has changed for us. We don't use as much of our own equity. We're doing a lot of partnerships. Um, we've sold you know, half of eight malls to a group out of, out of Australia. We sold 75% uh, of Atlantic Yards to Shanghai Greenland. You know, we, uh, we started a fund with uh, Arizona Retirement Fund to go and do residential projects. So, you know, uh, I would say that, that the stuff that I'm talking about, when it translates into numbers, you wouldn't know the difference. The only thing that you might notice the difference in is that I'm outperforming other buildings. That, 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 might be, that might be true. Um, but from a pure numbers perspective, this, these projects should perform as well or better than other projects if we do them correctly, and that's the whole theory. I mean, this, this whole thing, I mean, don't, don't, you know, <laughs> don't get confused by me talking about art and culture and other things that think that we're not a for-profit Oh yeah, company. you wanna make money. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly out there to make a buck, and I think, I think this helps us. I think this helps us do that, right? Because if we can create a place that has that strange attraction to people, that people want to be there, that companies say, you know, the first question they ask is, oh, that's great, I want to be there, how do I get in there? And then they ask me what they have to pay, 
then I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. If the first thing they want to know is the rent, then I think that I'm in trouble, right? Because that's not, what I'm, that's not what I'm delivering to them. So I'm trying to deliver to them a project that inspires them, a project that makes them say, that's where I need to be, you know? Um, so I, I mean, you draw all kinds of different examples of, of stuff like that. And then uh, um, as far as partners, you know, I can take one of these projects and, and, and I could sort of sneak all this stuff in, right? So Arizona Retirement Fund, yeah, you know, I don't really care so much that I'm going to create, uh, on the, at the base of the building, I'm going to create a market and I'm going to have a florist and a potter and a restaurant and they're all going to work together and the, the restaurant's going to use the pottery and the flowers and they're going to give free food to the, you know what I mean? I'm going to create this little ecosystem, right? They don't care. They just want to know what the rent is and you know if we're hitting our numbers, right? So I'm going to do it because I think it helps. I think it helps our rents. I think it helps the building. I like it. I think it's cool. So it's fun to do, um, and it should all it should all equate to something something greater. Again, that idea of the sum of the parts. Yeah. Uh, this is great. I really appreciate seeing this approach to urban design, which I think a lot of what we're hearing is, uh, and as an architect that, that works with uh, UX designers often, I think that the direction that you're focusing is um, really important. I'm curious, though, how, uh, while the model may play out in a sort of typical um, financial model, does the architecture, the hardware, that is the thing that we actually are studying in a school like this, if I went here, um, does it actually change? Or have you found, because as somebody that's working with some of these questions, I'm sort of looking at, is there a parking structure that can become an office building that can become a residential building? Um, and I'm curious if you've actually seen typologies that have shifted in any way? Um, nothing quite that dramatic, although we've certainly thought about it. I mean, we looked at, we looked at a project in uh, Culver City, I think it was right at the corner of Washington and Venice, and it was, it's an it's a, it's a expo line stop. And the expo line, in their infinite wisdom, said that because the train was stopping there, they needed 600 parking spaces. But once the next stop was made, they only needed 300 parking spaces. So great, so I'm gonna build 600 parking spaces and then I'm only, you're only gonna need 300, so what am I gonna do with the rest of them? So we were trying to figure out how we might build a parking garage that could change its use. Um, I've never really seen anything quite that dramatic as to what you're talking about, but I will tell you certainly up at this project up in San Francisco, when we give this type of presentation to the architect <clears throat> who was designing the office buildings, it informed his design and it informed the decisions that he made and it informed the everything down to the facades that he was doing, to where you put the cores, to how it meets the ground, right? Because, you know, we want, we want the people from the building spilling out into the interior courtyard. We don't want them spilling out onto the street, right? Because that's sort of like, the energy is going out into the city as opposed to coming down into the center court of the, of the property, and that's where we want the energy to collect, right? So we want, we want to force people to go through that center portion of the site. So, you know, I, I think it's a very dynamic, uh, interaction between the two, I, I frankly, I think it would be fascinated if it moved to the to what you're describing because again, it's like you build these buildings and they're there for 50, 100 years or whatever, and things are going to change. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to change. So, how can we think about the adaptability of a building? I mean, you know, some of these office buildings are are th that we're looking at are the dimensions that you could turn them into a residential building. You know, they're 65 feet wide and you know 100 feet long you know, because they want the light penetration in their office. Side core designed as an office, but you could flip that to a residential building, not, not wouldn't be too difficult. So, you know, that, and, that, and that, that, is, that is part of our thinking. Some of that is part of what I'm talking about. Some of that is just, you know, the economics of the deal and realizing that you may have to flip things around because very often residential retail office are not all going crazy all at the same time, right? I mean, in today's world, it feels sort of like they all do, they all either all do great or they're all doing bad, but um, um, that's not how it's been in the past. It's not been my experience in the past. Anybody else? I, I, I'm curious if anyone has any thought, I don't know how much more time we have, but I'm curious of, if anyone has any thoughts about this first question that I put up here, what would the best version of this look like? What would the elements of the what elements of the idea are missing? And I don't know how much I really I don't know how much I described it enough that you guys could even answer that question. Sometimes it takes uh, a couple times to sort of understand some of the more sort of conceptual things we're talking about. But I would be really curious if there's anything that you guys would look at from your perspective 
around the built environment, how you would, would think about how this plays out. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of questions around, you know, what is the conversation at the beginning? How does the architecture respond to that conversation? Um, but, but, you know, is there anything else that comes up? Well, I may have one thought, and I think that for the last decade, architecture has been used largely as a kind of lever to produce iconic things. Uh -huh. And so we end up with cities that are full of very special things, but some of them are not connected. So I think that, you know, if there could be a way to kind of move away from just the idea of the singular icon towards some discussion around something more authentic, that would be helpful because I think that, you know, architects have been kind of hung on, up on this problem and have been criticized for it, but we haven't come up with another way to convince, I think, um, the world that it, it, architecture has another purpose and it's not just to make sort of shiny things that are reflective of, you know, our current status, but actually to produce something, you say old fashioned, but to produce something that's longer lasting. So I think moving that conversation away from like, you know, the best use of architecture is to make a really special thing to maybe asking a deeper question, which is that, you know, if architects can solve many of these questions, they're, they're nuanced. And I think that there's a difficulty right now in convincing communities that, you know, if it's not Disney Concert Hall, what else is it? So getting into a more granular discussion around, you know, how architecture could be useful, to, whether it's housing or it's community or it's transit, I think is, I think would probably be one way. Yeah, yeah, really use it to, to, to inspire the community and, mm -hmm. and, and allow a, a canvas or a platform on which things can happen, you know, as opposed to just architecture for architecture's sake, right? I'm not sure if I have a question. <laughs> I'm way, maybe some question will come in the middle, but uh, I'm trying to put together this big puzzle in my head. Like, it's interesting to have you. Uh, first, thank you uh, for coming and, and lecture on, on this, which is highly educative, at uh, least for me. But it's interesting to see you lecture um, week to week with the uh, deputy mayor of Barcelona. Because basically there are two completely different models in play about the construction of the city. One is in which it's still the political power trying to enforce certain rules, even though they are in a crisis and changing it to a different format. But still you can see the desire to still understand the construction of the city of architecture as a piece of power. So that their goal is not necessarily to make money out of it, but it's to make a lasting impact of whatever particular political structure at any given time. And then, the, the, the other hand, the, the, our system, the one that we have here, which is based on private development, uh, I would say 98% of what we do. So to, to me, to try to negotiate in those two worlds, what is the role of architecture in both of those things, and try to understand what it is an interesting problem. But I think maybe to, to tap on, on what Peter was just mentioned, and to tap to some of the things that you mentioned in, in, in the lecture was, one, I will say, the, the problem of the icon, I will argue, is we don't have enough good projects, so the few ones, they turn to become icons because the rest are crap. Right. So maybe the solution is to make much more interesting buildings so nobody will look at them as anomalies of icons, they will become the new normal. Uh, and, and, but I don't know, that's part of the thing, because one thing I find interesting in, in your talk, first of all, very few lectures generated many questions. Probably everybody's trying to get a commission out of this or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing I found interesting is you didn't, you didn't show, and I, I, I think it's on purpose, you didn't show how any of these things look like. I mean, you're talking about more in conceptual frames so on. So what would be the best version of this look like? My question is, in relation to that, is how you guys think on the cultural role of the legacy or any project that you do? Because there, is, there was a recent, very interesting article about San Francisco that you mentioned many times, probably the most liberal city in America, yeah. and he's losing his social liberal co uh, core because it's becoming so expensive that the social diversity that he used to have is fading away. So what are the consequences? I mean, that's a political ideological problem, but that's maybe because they don't care that much about architecture looks like maybe there is a relation there. I I'm not sure about this, that's what I'm saying. And I don't think there is the right answer for some of these questions. And I, I will say in general terms, nobody will disagree with the way that you guys are trying to approach it. But how it looks like, what is the meaning of it, I think it matters a lot. Um, and I think everybody will give you a different take. But whether we like it or not, architecture still has that slowness and heaviness and so on. And when it's done, it's going to be there for a long time. That's right. So how the things is done, it matters a lot. Because to me, the, the only thing, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sometimes 
apprehensive about some of these strategies is rely too much on almost in non, in the, in, I'm not saying that you, that's what you do, but sometimes with people talking these terms, it's almost relying on the production of all these things with almost no design. Like, uh, okay, an open floor plan, an open space, you boom things and so on. So I'm interested in how we negotiate that because we are not in Europe in which we still have that, 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 that desire. We are in this season in which the developers and the company want to make money, the architects want to do what they want to do. And it still seems to me that we don't quite speak the perfect language. It's almost between printers and computers. That after 50 years, we still can't figure it out to work it <laughs> properly. So we sort of talk, and that's why I think it's important, this conversation, but I don't think that it's a, the right answer. Um, but that's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not so sure I have a question for you. It's, it's more, because the, the, the last thing I want to say when you were mentioning about the iPhone, which I think you're absolutely right, is what you do with it, but the way that it feels and it looks, it matters, because pretty much at that time, any smartphone did the same thing. That's right. And none of them was as successful as the iPhone. And That's it was right. a power of design, a power of interactivity with individuals that makes a whole difference. It was not only the technology of it. And by the way, it's the only company that's driven by design, I know by technology, yeah. as, as the main premise. So to me, how you position that, it seems to me like a key, a key one. So yeah. uh, that would be a bunch of random yeah. points. And, and I think I think Apple is a fascinating example, and could be and could be compared to all different kinds of things, right? So I, I don't I don't know that I agree that they're not a technology company. I think they are very. I didn't much say that they're not. I just said their first decision is based on design. Technology follows design. Yeah, right. And and, and it informs design. And it and it, you know, it it, it it's a constant feedback between the two, but but neither one, as I see it, is really dominating. But neither one really all works out all that well without the other. So you could have this beautiful iPhone, but if you didn't have iTunes and blah, 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 then, you know, yes, it would be a great object, but it wouldn't have all those other things, right? You know, this MacBook Pro is, a, is, is, is wonderful to use because it's ergonomic and because it fulfills all those things, but, it, boy, it feels so cool when you pick it up and it's got the weight and it's got the, right, and it's got the smooth lines and it's, it's you know, it's delicious, right? So they feed together. They have to work together. And I think that that's really the, 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 the approach, right? So it's not, it's not necessarily saying, what, what's my end goal? Do I want to build an icon? And it's not my end goal to say, okay, I just want to create community, so build whatever you want. I don't really care. I'll infuse it with whatever I need, right? Because look, we take over old buildings and turn them into great things, right? And they're not necessarily beautiful buildings, right? We feed them with, with, with really cool things. So, but if it's well designed, if it's well thought out, if, it's, if they work together, if the, if, if, the, if, the, if the end result fulfills both needs, then I think that you've really come up with something really interesting and something that will stand, hopefully stand the test of time because of, its, because of that approach. Am I the last one or is it somebody else? <laughs> I think invited get you to them next time. Uh, it's a couple, a couple of points that, that I think in a, to create some distance between what everybody is running after or sort of the Pied Piper of Steve Jobs. Hmm. Hooray, hallelujah, and all of that. But there are as many discussions about how the technology separates people as it does how the technology sure. connects people, <clears throat> what it does to kids' minds, what it focuses on, what it ignores, and, and all of that. So in the longer term, when, when uh, evaluations are made over periods of time about what these things mean, they mean something substantive in terms of, of, of what they do and how they're used and how they're advocated for. It doesn't necessarily mean that anything you said or contributed to the discussion should be other than it is. But, but I, think, I think that aspect of what we're involved in now, to say that certain tools are, are useful, CATIA is useful. We don't have CATIA, we can't do anything. Can't. And, and, but that's a different discussion than an 11-year-old who can't, who can't put it down, cannot physically put it down. I know, I watch it. Me as and, well. And, and uh, it's addictive in ways. So, so I'm just saying there's a certain amount of ambiguity in that, in that question, uh, in that issue, that people who are listening to the discussion ought to at least be, be cognizant of. 
Another thing that, that might be suggested somewhere between you and what, what the, the Barcelona model is, has to do with infrastructure and the role of infrastructure and big pieces of, of the city that are unit dimensional. And all you have to do is, is cruise around LA and you can see, well, what's east of the 405, what's west of the 405, what's north of the 110, what's uh, yeah, or east of the 110, what's north of the 101 side, and you can see how the city in many ways, and it, it, it's not only the freeways, it's the so-called river and, and power grids and so on, has, has been used to, to sociologically in many cases, this is probably an overstatement and a caricature, but to stratify the city and to subdivide it in, in ways that, that planning would suggest aren't particularly healthy and in a certain way, you have to overcome that in terms of what you might do. And it seems to me there's, there's a role for, the inter for redefining the infrastructure and integrating the development of infrastructure with private development, which ameliorates the single-mindedness of the infrastructure. I mean, you're talking about that site at, at, at uh, Venice and National or what, Washington National, whatever, whatever right. it is. Right. And of course, you have to deal with a city there that's, that's, that's uh, not uh, and, and led and, by, and, I don't and know, my, Robert Moses or Baron Houseman or, <laughs> or, or, or whoever you like, and you have to negotiate that. But I mean, if somebody said, hey, Kevin, why don't you take a walk out here to the LA River or deal with the uh, with the expo line stop at La Cienega and Jefferson. And you can start to make a piece of a city which is integrated with a substantial piece of infrastructure. And you don't see a lot of that. I mean, I was looking at that. That's a train stop, big train stop, uh, key uh, north-south route to the airport, to Sunset and the other way, USC to the beach. And they stacked up seven stories of cars and went away. And if you go a little bit uh, east of that, La Brea, they got nothing. So they got train stopping, they got nothing else. And ditto at Crenshaw. It seems to me, I mean, I don't know how you penetrate that. We tried with Jan and a few other people and couldn't sort of, I mean, had to deal with, with Moliere and Thor Rick Thorpe and, you know, all those guys that are, that are doing the trains and uh, who are intelligent guys in their own way, but have, it, so it seems like there's, there's a venue for the redefinition of infrastructure in terms of existing pieces and how that works or whether that's just too much a pain in the neck for you guys to take that on, because it probably is unless you have somebody on the inside uh, who's, who's helping you. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a topic and you could see it, I mean, for instance, I think Ted's down there at the end, that, that their project. And, and this is a slightly different one, but, but bumping into the 110 and the 10 suggests that, that maybe that all buildings are the wrong size and that, that buildings in concept are so determined by sites and property lines and setbacks and height limits and all of that. And the way to do some of the things, I mean, you're not going to get a couple floors of a million square feet unless you grab a few more pieces, and that you could redefine the city completely by changing the definition of the size of projects that you would take on. I mean, you tried that, and bro I mean, you guys have tried that a few times. Right, so, so I mean, the things that, that immediately come to my mind when, when uh, I think about at least a piece of what you said is Atlantic Yards is really taking, I think it is the highest density of train traffic anywhere in the, in the United States and decking over it and is that building. the Ife? What's that? Is that Ife? Is that the Shanghai? Yeah, guy? yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and decking over it and building 6,000, you know, housing units. 50 some odd percent of them are. Are you affordable. guys doing that? Or are huh? you? Yeah, you, that's that's Atlantic Yards. So Atlantic Yards is the arena, which we've already built, which is where the Nets play. And then the rest of it, there's a portion of it that we can build on now, but that's another, you know, 500 units, right? The rest of it, which is about another. 4,000 or 5,000 units, it, it, we, have to dr we have to deck over the rail lines and create a platform in order to build on it. So, and, it's and like infrastructure. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of the way to do it. That's infrastructure, right? And then I think about in downtown Dallas, right, where they decked over that freeway and connected one side of the city with the other side of the city, and it's amazing what that's done to that city. 
and they're talking about it with the 110, right? They're talking so, about one in Hollywood. Right. In the, right in the middle Hollywood, of Hollywood. Right. Maybe. Exactly. The 101. 50, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I think, I think that the city is going to have to force themselves to think about that, particularly, I mean, you know, look, I, I think that, that uh, you know, cities growing out is the wrong way to go. Cities need to densify. They need to grow up. Um, and all of that stuff. They don't need to be 23 stories everywhere. They only need to be probably, you know, what's Paris, six stories sort of everywhere, and they pack in a lot of people. So, um, um, you know, but as you think about that, things like what you're talking about, Eric, you can't, you can't waste that space. You know, it becomes precious space. And then, and then you get value, and then you get, you know, uses for it, and then, and, then, and then all of a sudden it starts making economic sense, right? So if you deck over the freeway, now you've connected two pieces of, of, of a city, reconnected two pieces of the city, which were connected before, but have now been severed. And now all of a sudden, the, the land around them becomes way more valuable. Whereas before, maybe someone doesn't want to build a building next to a freeway, although you wouldn't know that from driving around Los Angeles. But you know, certainly more value if it's a park than if it's a freeway, right? So I think that there's, there's a symbiotic relationship between those that can be created, but someone needs to take that first step. Someone needs to jump into the pond and say, okay, I'm going to spend money without necessarily getting a quote unquote return. And that's often municipalities. I mean, I think that's a big problem when we lost redevelopment. I think that redevelopment was a big tool, right? The redevelopment would buy a parcel and turn it into a park. Redevelopment would go buy a parcel that was not doing well and they'd come to me and they'd give it to me for free and tell me to go build something on it. Now some strings came with that and other things came with it. I have to deal, you have to deal with the city, you have to deal with the public-private joint venture, you gotta negotiate, you gotta do prevailing wage, you gotta do all these other things. But at the end of the day, we think we get a lot of value and the city gets a lot of value when things change. So I think that it, it you know, it need, there needs to be you know, the, the go government needs to be able to take an approach that says that I'm going to be the catalyst because I have a larger plan, a larger vision, and if I do these three, four things, big things like decking over a freeway or building a light rail, but what do I do around the light rail? How do I, how do I then <coughs> use that to spur economic development so that now the private sector will, 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 will come in and do it of their own volition without me having to say, you know, hold their nose to the grindstone and say, you know, you will do this. I don't care if you make money or not. It's not going to work, right? So you need to create that feedback loop so that they'll, so that the system will, will begin to create these things. But I, I mean, I look, I think you're 100% right. I mean, you know, when you when I drive through the city and I have my you know my map up and you you know you 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 know and the, and the freeways are these red lines right that are going through the city and you see how the city just sort of comes up to them and stops and it's clear that the street, all the streets used to connect all the way through and someone just said boom through you know and then just completely messed up the whole thing right. Um, um, so now how do, we, how do we repair that? How do we think about that? And how do we use that in a way that could be positive for the whole city? I think it's a fascinating conversation. Um, I think it's tough in economic times like this. I think it's tough to get a city to direct their capital towards it. I mean, in Dallas, I think that was funded privately, right? I mean, Dallas is a very different, Texas is a very different place. I don't know how many of you have spent a lot of time in Texas, but it's different down there. Um, and you know, in Dallas, we did a bunch of projects in downtown Dallas. You know, there, there, there is a very strong corporate uh, uh, community involvement. Like the, the large corporations in Dallas, of which there are a lot, they feel they have a civic responsibility to invest in their cities. So they went out and came up with this, this idea to deck over the, the, the freeway, and they designed it, they paid for it. They, went to, they didn't go to the city to ask permission, they told the city what they were going to do, and they did it. You know, that doesn't happen out here tax structures and other things are different too down there. So, but it's just a different way of approaching it, right? Uh, is one better than the other? I don't know. My guess is that the, is that the private, public sector has a better chance of doing that, but oftentimes they can't get out of their own way. It's really interesting though. Anyway, thanks very much. It's an unusual yes, talk and I think great. <laughs>